Hello and welcome everyone to the Varsity Tutors Virtual Field Trip Series where we are so excited to take a dive back in time and learn about the art of miniatures with the Mini Time Machine Museum of Miniatures. Now we're joined today by Education Director Mackenzie Nassman of the Mini Time Machine Mich Museum of Miniatures, who's going to show us how art and history collide in a brilliantly small way. Now, before I hand it off to Mackenzie to get us started, I wanna make sure we're prepared to be as collaborative and as interactive as possible in this live virtual field trip. So just a few things to keep in mind. Today's exhibits may be small, but our opportunity for participation is gonna be big. So as we move through the lesson, feel free to use the chat function on the right-hand side of your screen to ask Mackenzie any questions you might happen to have and to answer the questions she's going to have for you throughout the lesson. And if we don't get to your questions in real time, we'll have about 10 minutes at the close of the lesson specifically set aside for Q&A with Mackenzie. Now, you'll also want to have a ruler or with parental assistance, the tape measure handy to participate in some of today's activities. You'll also want to have a camera close by because toward the end of the lesson, you'll have the opportunity to lean into the screen and pose for a selfie. And if you tag Varsity Tutors and Mini Time Machine, you'll have an opportunity to win a three month subscription to VT Plus. Now we'll talk more about the prize, more about the specifics on how to enter toward the end of class. But in the meantime, I'm gonna go ahead and hand it off to Education Director at the Mini Time Machine Museum of Miniatures, Mackenzie Massman. Hi, my name is Mackenzie Massman, and as Haley said, I am the Director of Education at the Mini Time Machine Museum of Miniatures in Tucson, Arizona. Um, in this session, I'm going to show you some of the amazing miniatures that we have in the collection of our museum. Talk about uh, who makes miniatures and why and how they do it. And finally, share some ways that you can try to make your own miniatures at home. Mini Time Machine Museum of Miniatures. Wow, that's a lot of words. And I understand that that might be a little bit confusing. So let's try to break it down into some parts. The founders of the museum, Pat and Walter Arnell, loved miniatures. Uh, Pat had a dollhouse as a child in the 1930s, and it was very, very special to her. So as an adult, she began collecting and making miniatures. The collection grew, and the Arnells dreamed of having a way to share it with more people. So the concept of the Mini Time Machine Museum was born out of the idea that visitors would like uh, to be transported to another time period in history, to other countries or to other places through the miniatures in the collection. The Mini Time Machine Museum opened in 2009 and now contains over 500 miniature houses, room boxes, and other collections. The next part of the title is museum. Think about a museum that you have visited in the past. What type of a museum was it? What kinds of things did they have on display? Take a minute and type into the chat a couple of things that you may remember from visiting museums in the past. I see that some of you um, mentioned visiting art museums, uh, history museums, children's museums, science centers. Um, at art museums, you may have seen paintings and sculptures and photographs and drawings. Um, at a science center, some of you have seen fossils and, and uh, watched experiments. Um, children's museums probably had a lot of things you could play with or touch. The museum is a place that cares for collections of things, artifacts other, uh, and other objects of artistic, cultural, historical, or scientific importance. And they display them usually in exhibits. What are exhibits and what are collections? So think about your house. Do you or any of the members of your family collect anything? Type in the chat and share some of the things that you or your family members might collect. What are some things that you like to display in your home as part of your collections? I can see that some of you like to collect things from nature, rocks or shells, um, leaves. Others like to collect different things and different kinds of toys, 
um, like dolls or Lego minifigures or cars. Some of you might collect um, cards like baseball cards or Pokemon cards. Um, you want to take care of your collections and show them off to your friends and family. Museums work in a very similar way. The Mini Time Machine Museum has a large collection, has large collections of miniatures. So what is a miniature? You may have heard that word used to describe something that is small or tiny or even itsy bitsy. But what makes something a miniature is not just that it's small. A miniature is a small scale reproduction or small version of something. Miniatures are smaller than regular or life size. So you've got to ask yourself, is an ant or a mouse a miniature? Both things are small, but they're not miniatures. Ants and mice are the size that they are supposed to be. That's their real life size. If you were going to make a miniature mouse, it might fit on the tip of your finger. If you were going to make a miniature ant, you might need a microscope to be able to see it. Miniatures are much smaller than regular size. I'm going to show you a lot of examples of different kinds of miniatures as we go through the slides in the session today. The Me Time Machine Museum exhibits and highlights all sorts of amazing miniatures that are part of our collections. One of the galleries at our museum is called the Enchanted Realm. It's a magical place with woodland creatures, a snow village that you can see under the floor, uh, fairy castles, and a witch's, even a witch's and Halloween compound. The centerpiece of the gallery is a large tree that was actually designed by some of the Disney Imagineers. If you've ever seen the movie Pocahontas, you might recognize the tree as being something similar to some of the uh, designs that show up in that film. Another, other exhibits in our museum feature miniatures that are over 100 or even over 200 years old. Another has miniatures that are so small that they might have been carved on the tip of a pencil. One of the most important exhibits that we have talks about the mathematical concept of scale. Wait, 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 wait. What, what does math have to do with art? Many of the core skills that are involved in art are also involved in math. I bet you didn't know that. Both disciplines require spatial reasoning, recognizing patterns, geometry, like shapes and symmetry, and the vital concept when talking about miniatures, the concept of measurement. Miniaturists often make objects that are very familiar to us, a chair, a house, or a store. These tiny creations are brought to life through careful observation, construction, and just a sprinkle of math. In the past, most miniature makers didn't use math ratios to make their art. The artists would guess about what size their miniatures should be based on their visual observation. The results and the finished products were beautiful, but they had all sorts of relative size differences. You may have heard the term out of scale. They were all out of scale. This uh, example that you see on the screen is a German grocery store from the mid 1800s. Um, it's an example of a, of a miniature that has its pieces that are out of scale. If you look, you can see that some of the mugs and jugs and bottles are actually so big that the dolls could sit in them. The, the jugs don't fit on the shelves. In fact, if you look in the bottom corner, you can see that there are coins in this miniature. Those coins aren't miniatures at all. They're actually real life coins. They're real money. 
By the 20th century, miniaturists started using a mathematical system to shrink objects from everyday size. They used ratios. A ratio is a mathematical concept used to describe the relationship between one quantity and another quantity. The ratio used to describe the relationship between inches and feet is one of the most popular ratios used in making fine scale miniatures. There are 12 inches contained in every foot. So the ratio is written one to 12. The one to 12 ratio is then described by miniaturists as the one inch scale, where one foot in life size becomes one inch in miniature. The miniatures themselves are then one twelfth the size of real life. The best way to learn about scale and is to try calculating ratios yourself. Here are a couple of suggestions for how you could do that. A simple project might be to measure your own height and perhaps, or perhaps the dimensions of something like a book and then try to calculate how small that book or that or you would be in miniature. For example, I am five foot six inches tall. That's 66 inches total. A one inch scale miniature of me would be five and a half inches tall. It would be like this. Another option to learn more about how things look in scale is to try measuring something bigger, like the room that you're in or a room in your school. Um, you can try using the math to calculate how much, th what that size would be, and then try sketching it on graph paper or any kind of paper. The key is to just try to do the math. For a one inch scale, you're going to divide by 12. Just to also let you in on a little secret, if you look in this picture, this slide features a cameo appearance by my fourth grade son and also one of our amazing docent tour guides. Can you guess who is who? What size would they be if they were, be, or were a, a miniature? The one inch scale may seem very small, but it's not the smallest possible. It sounds like some kind of a riddle, but what size would a building be if you wanted to put a dollhouse inside a dollhouse? The answer is a doll's dollhouse scale miniature, a model that is one 144th scale. What does that mean? It's very, very small. If I wanted to live in one of these houses that you can see on the screen, the little dollhouses, I would need to be 0.45 inches or only 11 millimeters tall. That's the only way that I would be able to go into those houses. Now that you know a little bit about scale, let's talk more about why miniatures are made and how they are created. Throughout history, many different cultures have created their own variations of miniatures. Some were created for religious reasons, cultural reasons, social, educational, or some just purely artistic reasons. Fine art miniatures are the product of an artist's imagination, passion, and skill. Some miniatures are cherished not only for their artistic value, but also because they serve a function. For example, in Thailand, many spirit houses are, common, are a common part of the landscape. These little houses, like you can see on the screen, are, provide homes for the sometimes mischievous spirits that get disrupted by the construction of houses or roads. If the builders erect a little spirit house nearby, 
it's believed that the spirits are not left homeless. They can move in to the little house. Many of the spirit houses come in different shapes and sizes, but they typically rep uh, resemble Thai homes or simple Buddhist temples. Miniatures can also be made as educational models. You may have heard these called dioramas. Models can represent a scene with three-dimensional figures. Sometimes the scene reflects something that happened in the past. The Mini Time Machine Museum's Time of the Pharaohs miniature that you can see on this slide depicts a scene of several ancient Egyptian workers constructing a pyramid. This miniature was not made in ancient Egypt, but it is a way to try to imagine what the world might have looked like during that time period. Some miniatures are also made as children's toys. Historically, this was play with a purpose. The purpose was to teach children um, how to cook and take care of their homes through small little dollhouses. This is the oldest piece in the museum's collection. It is a Nuremberg kitchen from 1742. From the 17th century to well into the 20th century, the most popular toy rooms were the kitchen. This kitchen is a room box. It's a display space, much like a stage set, um, used for highlighting the interior of just one room rather than an entire house. Would you want to play with this type of toy? Is this something that you would have in your house? Some of you may want to play with that type of kitchen, but maybe this one that you see on the slide right now, maybe this one seems a more, little bit more like the one that you have at your home. This is a kitchen toy from 1909. And the purpose of the miniature remains the same as the one from 1742. This was designed as a toy for, for children to learn how to maintain a small home. The child would be able to play with the kitchen, use the tiny brooms and the hand brushes and the dustpan. These tools would encourage them to, to practice and take pride in their chores. Working features in this kitchen, such as the small reservoir to hold water that made the faucet turn on and off um, to help wash the dishes or clean the floors. There was the room for a small candle to go under the stove that could be used to warm the little pots and pans. And even um, in the center next to the big hutch is a small but functional coffee grinder. All of these things were used by children to learn. But not all miniatures are toys. This is called a baby house. It was made in England in 1775. A typical baby house was built to display collections of miniature furniture. It's not meant to represent a scaled down home. And it also wasn't designed for kids. These houses were designed as status symbols for grown-ups. The adults that owned them used them to show off that they could not only afford to have regular furniture that they would use in their house, but they could also afford to have miniature furnishings that were purely decorative and not functional. Some people who make miniatures, both in the past and today, do it because they enjoy the challenge and the process of constructing something so small. This miniature that you see on this slide is an example of that concept. Toward the end of his life, the man that made this, this miniature, Emil Wick, decided to create five masterpiece mechanical houses for his five godchildren. Each house was unique. This wooden house was designed to be typical of a hotel or home in Switzerland. And it's populated by mechanical figures that moved 
using a key winding and weight driven mechanism. Inside the cabinet base, there is a musical cylinder that chimes out two different tunes, like a music box. Wick was fascinated by all of the intricate machinery that went in to clock making. That was the hobby that he'd had for, since childhood. He used the methods of traditional Swiss clockmakers to help him engineer all of the mechanical parts, the springs, the weights, the pulleys and wires to set this miniature in motion. Wick's profession was as a portrait photographer. So he modeled all of his figures after people that he knew. Though they were very simply carved, each one of the figures would have been recognizable to Wick's friends and family. And in fact, the little woman that's um, sort of getting water from the well was designed to look like his housekeeper. Around the same time in the 1880s, other miniature artists were uh, also starting to focus on accuracy and detail in their craftsmanship. In the 1880s, John Bellamy built this reproduction of his home in West Newton, Massachusetts, which is just outside Boston. He built it for his younger sister, but she wasn't very interested in it. So the dollhouse was stored unfinished in the family's attic until his sister's heirs sold it to an art dealer. The people who purchased the house in the 1970s restored it with lots of attention to detail. The house itself in Massachusetts still stands today, but it's changed slightly over time. However, when you look through this, this miniature, it tells a whole story of its own with rooms filled with people, The Bellamy Dollhouse offers you a glimpse into home life of a family in the late 1800s or early 1900s. It features lots of, of figures doing their daily chores, such as doing the laundry, cooking, uh, taking care of children, all in very detailed, in, in very exact detail. While some miniatures are inspired by people's own homes, others get their inspiration from famous places around the world. Using photos in books and magazines, a master, master miniaturist might be inspired to create a place they never actually visited before. Charlotte Schoenbach, the artist who made this piece, Chateau Manon, is a great example. Charlotte loved the images of European castles, palaces, and mansions featured in magazines like Architectural Digest. She studied the details in the photographs and filled notebooks with pages and pages of ideas and references. Those notebooks are now preserved as part of the museum's collections. And with these notes, it shows the creative journey that she took to make this large miniature. She spent over 30 years on that process. She didn't start off to create just one palace or one real place. Instead, she combined lots of different elements from many different places to make the rooms all uniquely her own. One of the most exciting elements of Schoenbach's Chateau Menot is the way that she found clever ways to incorporate found or recycled objects into her miniatures. The numerous beads and pieces of costume jewelry from thrift stores became chandeliers. Painted seashells were used to um, add to the faux gilded moldings. Perhaps the most imaginative example of recycling in this miniature was the use of an empty, empty lipstick tube as a tiny gold trash can in the office next to the desk. You can see some images of those in this slide. 
While some artists relied on their personal interests as inspiration for their miniatures, others hired were hired specifically to create amazing works of art as commissions. This example, the Yellow Rose of Texas, is by an artist named Brooke Tucker. She completed this miniature dollhouse um, as an elaborate little world with her own spin and her own creative story. Look at this house. Would you want to live in a house like this one? Take a minute and type either yes or no in the chat to let me know if you'd like to live in this type of house. It looks like we might have some yeses and some noes. For me, I wouldn't want to live there for two reasons. First, the house has a very, very small kitchen. Tucker did not cook and she initially forgot to put a kitchen in the mansion at all. When the buyer, the person who commissioned the house, mentioned that it was missing a kitchen, she decided to find a space to squeeze it in, but it was very teeny tiny and it actually doesn't even have an oven or any kinds of appliances. Another reason that I wouldn't want to live in this house is that it doesn't appear to have any full bathrooms or toilets. I know that I wouldn't want to live in a house that didn't have those. Tucker's house, dollhouse is also designed to tell a story. It doesn't have any figures or people, but it tells a story with the miniatures that are placed in the home. The small details that are spread throughout all the rooms in the house. Can you guess what kind of story she's telling based on the photos that are in this slide? Some of you may have guessed this is the day of a wedding. The bride's gown hangs in a closet in one of the bedrooms with her bouquet on a couch nearby. The ring bearer's pillow is in the front hall. The wedding cake is the highlight of the dining room, set out in a massive buffet of food. Even the car is decorated with flowers and ribbons for this special day, and gifts and presents are located throughout the house. It's a beautiful story of a wedding. While Brooke Tucker, while Brooke Tucker created an idealized dream mansion filled with the excitement of a wedding, other artists focus on a more accurate depiction of their environment and their reality. Mario Patino is a local artist here in Tucson working today. He makes miniatures that depict the gritty reality of his life and his neighborhood where he grew up, complete with rust stains, graffiti, cracks in the sidewalk, it's interesting to look at these because it, they remind you of what maybe your environment looks like. <laughs> Some artists create amazing miniature rooms and houses with fancy furniture, while others like to show reality. Some make complex stories and fantasy worlds. This miniature called Cauldron Coven by the founder of the museum, Pat Arnell, started as a commercial miniature kit of a Victorian dollhouse, but it was transformed into a Halloween witch's paradise, complete with modern conveniences like computers or a skateboard broom. There's Dracula, and mummies and a headless horseman also residing and exploring this incredible building. Exploring all the different rooms reveal new elements and details each time that you look at this miniature. To be honest, that's one of my favorite parts of my job, 
Every time I go out in the museum and look at the miniatures, I see new details that I never noticed before. Some miniatures might be spooky or a little scary, but others create imaginary fantasy worlds with also with very detailed stories. This is the Forget Us Not Castle, which rises out of the lake, according to the legends, only once per year and stands majestically for a single day, visible only to those who have fairy vision. If you were going to create a fairy castle or a fantasy castle, what types of things would you have lived there? Take a minute and type a few of those in the chat. Some of you mentioned dragons or monsters, mermaids, um, magical creatures. Many of those are included in this miniature. The lake at the base of the castle is filled with mermaids. There is a room that is dedicated to the tooth fairy. The tooth fairy's room actually has jars of baby teeth from Pat Arnell, the founder's grandchildren. Around the corner from the tooth fairy's room is the fairy's wing repair room where an, a busy elf is working on repairing fairy wings made from butterflies wings. The fairy king and queen sit on their thrones in another part of the castle and the roof is even guarded by dragons. Not all artists who make miniatures create doll houses or mansions or castles. Some artists like to use unique containers for their miniatures. All the tools and materials in this violin maker's workshop could really be used to make working violins. The bottles and jars contain real glue, varnish, resins, and pigments. The artist who made this was so dedicated to the accuracy that he wanted to make sure that it conveyed the sense of wonder. The miniature tools like the saws, for example, are actually sharp. And the tiny violins that the, were, are designed so that a, an artist or a musician could actually play them. These treasured miniatures required very skilled hands and also a finely tuned imagination. If you were going to make a miniature, what kinds of containers might you use? We've seen some amazing houses and furniture today. However, some artists like George Stewart, for example, prefer to make only figures as standalone miniatures. These examples carved between 1957 and 1958 are early works by George Stewart designed to show famous people who shaped human history. These are the famous and the infamous of ancient civilizations, European nobility, kings and queens, even Greek gods. As a self-taught artist, Stewart developed his techniques for building and detailing these miniature sculptures over 50 years. Eventually, they all started to have this very lifelike, realistic quality. Miniatures can also be inspired by popular culture or popular media. Some of them are even used in creating those uh, pieces of popular culture um, used in making movies or making television programs. This uh, miniature is a presentation of the 1996 movie, The Nutty Professor, which starred Eddie Murphy. The miniature was created by artist Glenda Hooker. 
Glenda had no formal training, but ventured into the world of miniatures by assisting fam a family member in furnishing a dollhouse. She began making her own dolls sculpted out of low firing clay built on wire armatures to make them flexible and poseable. Can you think of some ways that miniatures might be used to make movies or shows? One great example is stop motion animation. Models and miniatures are often used in creating those types of cartoons and movies. Now that you know a little bit about miniatures, let's talk about how you can start making them too. Your imagination can take miniature projects in whatever direction you would like. Some of you may want to do something as simple as making a hanger out of a paperclip or making a chair out of a plastic bottle cup, but bottle cap and some pieces of a drinking straw. Others may want to make something from cardboard tubes or old empty matchboxes, pom-poms or soda cans. Nature can also help provide an inspiration. You may find acorn tops that you can use to make into a tea set or sticks that can be put together to look like chairs. All of these options are available for you. You never know, you may decide that you want to create your own dream mini kitchen, or perhaps even design your own miniature art museum featuring all your masterpieces. We want to see your creations. So please, if you're making some miniatures, take some photos for us and post them on social media with tags for the Mini Time Machine Museum and for Varsity Tutors. Thank you. And I hope that you will be able to come visit the Mini Time Machine Museum of Miniatures in Tucson very soon. Wow, thank you so much, Mackenzie. We're so excited to hopefully see some of those miniatures that maybe you already have, or even some of those collections that Mackenzie was mentioning earlier on in the lesson. And in the meantime, in lesson two of the series in April, we're actually gonna have the opportunity to build some miniatures together. So we're looking forward to that opportunity as well. Now, in the meantime, it is time for that selfie. So I'm gonna go ahead and give you a moment to get your cameras at the ready. And in the meantime, as a quick reminder, if you post your selfies on Instagram and you tag us here at Varsity Tutors and the Mini Time Machine, you'll have the opportunity to win a three month subscription to VT Plus. And as a reminder, VT Plus offers hundreds of classes on topics from acting to archeology, span di dinosaurs to debate and everything in between. And as a subscriber, you can take as many of those classes as you like. So you can focus on things that you know you're passionate about and discover new interests along the way. Uh, and if you don't win, that's okay. VT Plus is available for just $19 a month. Now I'll be sure to put those Instagram tags back on screen at the end of the class. But in the meantime, I hope we're all ready for that selfie. Now, again, we'll be more formally working together to create those miniatures in our next lesson, but if you have any handy, feel free to include them in your selfie. And it looks like Mackenzie has a miniature of her own to show us, so take it away, Mackenzie. I, of course, have quite a few, but first wanted to show a little ruler, because as we know, math is important in making miniatures, and a teeny tiny little teapot. That is wonderful. Thank you so much, Mackenzie. And of course, if you guys didn't get your cameras at the ready quite on time, Mackenzie is going to be here with us answering some questions for the next few moments. So feel free to snap a photo then as well. Now, we've gotten lots of really fun questions, many of which you've actually already answered around what the oldest and the newest and the biggest and the smallest uh, exhibits at your museum are. So maybe you could speak a little bit to all of that at once and talk to us about how many miniatures you have, maybe some of your favorites and some of the largest and smallest that you have in your exhibits. 
Terrific. So I would love to do that. Um, actually, talking about the smallest miniatures, right now we have a temporary exhibit at the museum that features miniatures that are in the eye of a needle. They are created by an artist named Flor Carival, who is from Colombia, and she sculpts um, using a, a little magnifying glass. She sculpts teeny tiny miniatures that fit on the edge of a pin or fit inside the eye of a needle. Um, and so that's sort of an exciting smallest miniature that we have um, on display right now. I also, in some of the photos you may have seen, um, sculpted uh, miniatures that are sculpted, micro miniatures that are sculpted on the tips of pencils out of pencil lead. Um, those are some of the smallest that we have in our collection. Um, so those are really, really fun. Um, in terms of what my favorites are, my favorites change all the time because there are just so many exciting miniatures in the museum. We have over 500 in our collection. Um, so every day I go out and I see something new um, and I think, oh, this one is my favorite. Um, but they are all really amazing and very detailed. Um, I guess if I had to choose from the ones that you saw, I really love the Yellow Rose of Texas. Um, it's great. It's beautiful, large, fancy house. And it just seems like a great place. But I wouldn't want to live there. <laughs> That's wonderful. That's great. And I agree. I don't, I don't know that that small of a kitchen and no bathrooms would do it for me either. <laughs> no, 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 no. Not what we think of when we think of a mansion. You don't think of a teeny tiny little kitchen. Not quite. <laughs> so I know you showed us a couple of pretty old exhibits as well. So we had some questions around how you keep up with those older exhibits. So what do you do to preserve older exhibits, especially ones that are so tiny? So we actually do a couple of different things to help preserve those. Um, first of all, we work with conservators. Those are people who specialize in taking care of objects in museums that are older and making sure that they um, don't deteriorate, making sure that they stay nice. Um, we also try to make sure that the environment that are around those um, miniatures are very safe. So when you go to a museum, you may have seen objects that are inside cases, and many times we don't let people touch them or um, put their hands on them. That's because there are oils and, um, and dirt and things on your hands that can transfer to those objects and make them deteriorate faster. So we do everything we can to try to make sure that they're kept in a very clean, very um, climate controlled environment where there aren't anything that can damage them. So that's part of the reason that we that we keep them behind glass sometimes too. Well, that certainly makes a lot of sense. That's a lot of uh, very old materials that even when they were made were sometimes recycled that yes. you guys are keeping up to speed. Uh, yes. Now, and, go ahead. Well, no, one thing I was just going to say too. So the oldest thing in our collection is the 1742 kitchen, but that's not the oldest miniature that was ever made. There were many miniatures that have been made for long periods of time and other museums have some of those in their collections. It just happens that in our museum, we have the one that goes back to 1742, but that's not the oldest in the world. Yeah, I have, to, I have to imagine that even way back when folks were creating smaller versions of the things around them, or as you mentioned, the things that weren't around them. Exactly, absolutely. So, and as far, as far as the most recent thing, we we have artists that are making miniatures. We may have had an artist that made something last week. So everything up until today. Um, yeah. Wow. And we'll have even some even more recent miniature developments next class. Yeah. So I know you mentioned a couple of different functional miniatures. So miniatures that taught skills or served a particular purpose. We talked a lot about miniatures that helped children to feel a little more excited about their chores, but were there other types of, of functional miniatures that were used to teach different skills? Oh, absolutely. Um, so there are a lot of, I, I mentioned a couple of different reasons why people would make miniatures, but um, sometimes they made, uh, salesmen would make little samples that they would take around and use to help sell things. Um, so they would have examples of their products. Um, that was particularly true for when um, uh, the product itself was too big to be able to take it around and show people. Um, so salesman samples are one, uh, you know, other fun sort of functional miniature. Um, all of the different dollhouses had functions. So you've got um, dollhouses that, that focus on the kitchen and maybe focus on chores, but you've also got dollhouses that show how to take care of babies and children. Um, all of those are great ways um, that the, the miniatures could be functional. 
That is so cool. And I'm sure that a lot of students, and we had a, quite a few comments about this, uh, related things back to uh, kind of scale images for architecture or things like dioramas that they've made in school. So we can see where those are still super relevant today. Absolutely. And architectural um, miniatures are, are a huge, a big thing also. Um, that's a that's a really big part of miniature making as well. So you can see that, that making miniatures is actually a part of a lot of different careers and lots of different possibilities. Yeah, so we saw a lot of students who are a little bit surprised to hear how involved math is in the art that they maybe plan to pursue. But we can see how that's true, whether it's visual art or even things like architecture. That is so, so Absolutely, cool. absolutely. That Sorry, is... you can't get away from that. It's <laughs> everywhere. I love math, but I'm sure, I, you know, a lot of a lot of students viewing in will maybe, you know, feel a little more encouraged to jump into that geometry class after after today's session. Mm -hmm. Now, I know we're starting to run a little bit low on time. So do you have any parting thoughts for students before we return for your next class in April? So my parting thought for students is just try try making something just try making a miniature. It doesn't have to be perfect. Um, it doesn't have to be functional. It can just be fun. And, you know, with grown-up permission, try and use things that you find in your recycling or things that you, um, you know, find in nature. Um, explore ways to make those into something else. Um, it's a wonderful way to explore your creativity. Thank you so much, Mackenzie. And thank you, not just on behalf of Varsity Tutors, but all of the viewers out there who have had the opportunity to learn from you today. Uh, so thank you to Mackenzie at the Mini Time Machine Museum of Miniatures for joining us. And thank you to all of you who tuned in live for your questions and your comments in the chat for all of your participation. We hope you'll be back with us to design your very own miniatures during part two of the series on April 22nd and in one of the many other classes in our virtual field trip series soon. And in the meantime, don't forget, forget to post those selfies and to tag us at Varsity Tutors and Mini Time Machine to win. Thank you so much, everyone.